Well, Anchor Bible School is advancing very nicely, isn't it? Yes. It's amazing how much information God's Holy Word has and how inspiring and strengthening it is. Yes. You know, whenever I read Scripture and whenever I teach Scripture, my faith is increased and my faith is strengthened. You know, by repeating things, you are strengthening yourself. Yes. And so it's a real blessing uh, to share this material with you and I want to say that I appreciate greatly your willingness to take a whole week to come here to Fresno. Some of you drove from the East Coast. I know someone here who drove from Atlanta, Georgia. And I said, you know, really have something to look forward to driving back. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we'll pray that God will give you traveling mercies, brother. And uh, we appreciate you coming. Of course, uh, we have uh, people here from Australia, from Great Britain. I mean, it's, it's amazing that uh, we had so many people respond to uh, the invitation to come here to the Anchor Bible School. We do appreciate it, and we hope that it will be a blessing to all of you. Uh, in our last session today, we are going to discuss another story that we find in the Bible that is a typological story whose hero is Jesus Christ. And we're referring to one of the few occasions when a woman is a type of Christ. And that is the story of Esther. And so turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Esther, chapter 3, and uh, we're going to be looking at several things in this book, but we're going to begin in chapter 3. Now, the first thing that I would like to mention is that there are four key protagonists in this book. The first protagonist is a political figure. The political figure is, of course, Ahasuerus. His Greek name is Xerxes. The second figure is a religious figure. The second figure is called Haman. And by the way, Haman uh, is instigated by his wife. She's a shadowy figure in the story. Her name is Zeresh. And so basically you have three enemies of Mordecai and of the Jewish people. You have King Ahasuerus, you have Haman, and you have Zeresh, the wife of Haman, who is advising him. She's the advisor of Haman. And then of course, besides these three enemies, you also have Mordecai, he symbolizes the faithful remnant. And of course, along with Mordecai, you have the Jewish people. So you have God's people, and you have the three enemies of God's people. And then you have one other figure in the story, and that figure is an intercessory person. And that intercessory person is none other than Esther herself. She's the intercessor in favor of God's people at that time. Now it's important to realize what this battle really involves. When you look at the story you'll discover that the battle is between Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and Mordecai, whose total and complete name is also given in the book. Now this means that this controversy was much longer standing than just between these two individuals. Because if you look at the lineage of Mordecai, you're going to discover that Mordecai was a descendant of King Saul. And you're going to find that uh, Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, is a descendant of King Saul. Agag, who Saul was committed to kill, and Saul did not. And that's the reason why you have this story in the book of Esther. So the enmity is a long-standing enmity. It's not a recent enmity just in the days of Esther. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the Hebrew monarchy. Now behind the scenes, of course, is Satan himself instigating this threefold alliance to slay Mordecai and the remnant. In the book Prophets and Kings, page 601, 
we find this short statement about what the devil's intentions were. Ellen White states, Satan himself, the hidden instigator of the scheme, was trying to rid the earth of those who preserved the knowledge of the true God. So who was behind this triple alliance that we find here in the book of Esther, these three enemies? It was the devil himself, and he wanted to get rid of the knowledge of God, of the true God, in the earth. Now what was this controversy about? Let's go to Esther chapter 3 and read beginning with verse 2, Esther 3 and verse 2. And there are many things that we could say about uh, the first couple of chapters and succeeding chapters, but in the interest of time we're only going to be able to touch upon the highlights of the book. Verse 2 says, And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. So whenever Haman appeared, what did the servants do? They bowed before Haman. Now why did they do this? Let's finish reading the verse. For so the king had commanded concerning him. So is this a political decree to render homage to Haman? Yes, it is the civil power giving a decree to render homage to Haman. But there was a remnant that refused. Notice what it continues saying there in verse 2. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Incidentally, in the book of Esther the name of God is not mentioned. In fact you would believe that this is a secular, uh, secular experience that's taking place. Because it doesn't use the word worship, it says that, hey, that Mordecai would not uh, bow and pay homage to Haman. Hey, 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 it doesn't use the word worship. But we know that what is involved here is the issue of worship. At the end of the presentation I'm going to tell you why the name of God does not appear in the book of Esther. There's a, there's a theological reason why it isn't there. So really what you have here is a political figure working upon Haman, a religious figure, commanding everyone to bow and to pay homage to Haman. And then you have a remnant who says, I will not do it because I obey God's law and I only worship God. Notice verse 3, Then the king's servants, who were within the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress what? Why do you transgress the king's command? Now incidentally, let me mention that whenever in the Old Testament these two words bow and pay homage are used in the same verse, it always refers to worship. Without any exception, whenever the two words appear together, it, it has to do with worship. So we know that worship is involved here. So you find here that, that the king's servants say, why do you transgress what? The king's command. So why do you disobey the law of the civil power to render homage and reverence to Haman? So you have the political figure flexing his muscles and commanding worship to Haman. And then we find in verse 4, Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that is Mordecai would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Now in one of the principles that we're going to study, we're going to discover that a Jew today is a spiritual Jew. Those who have linked their lives with Jesus Christ in a covenant relationship. So here the enmity is because Mordecai was a Jew. Verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with what? Haman was filled with wrath. Does that sound familiar? 
Ah, you're starting to catch an interesting picture here of a controversy that is reflected in the book of Revelation. Now, let's continue. Let's go to verses 5 and 6. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast poor, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. In other words, there's using some, a certain type of witchcraft here to determine uh, a date, and we're going to see in a minute what that date involved. Actually, the date involves a death decree. So he's casting lots to discover what is the best moment to execute the death decree. Now notice verse 8. Here the controversy becomes even clearer. It says, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. In other words, there are people that are all over the place in your kingdom. Now listen carefully. Their laws are different from all other peoples. Is this a controversy over the law? What was the law of the Jews? The Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments say, worship only whom? God. And what was Haman requiring? He was requiring worship because who had commanded it? The civil power or the political power. Are you seeing how the story develops? And so he says, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples. And they do not keep the king's laws. What is the controversy here? It is between the law of God and the law of the civil power. But the law of the civil power is by instigation of whom? It is by instigation of Satan and Haman. And incidentally, Haman's wife is behind the scenes. You find her in chapter 5. She's the one that says to, to uh, Mordecai, to, to Haman, make a gallows for Mordecai so that he can hang there. She's the shadowy figure behind this, this woman, behind Haman. And so... Uh, Haman continues his argument by saying their laws are different from all other people's and they do not keep the king's laws. They don't keep the civil laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. In other words, they have to be eradicated. A death decree has to be given against them. What is Haman really arguing? Haman is saying, listen king, if you have people in your kingdom that don't obey your laws, eventually you're going to have anarchy in the kingdom. And your kingdom is going to fall apart. So for the good of your kingdom, if you want your kingdom to survive, you cannot allow these people who have different laws, who don't obey the law, to bow and reverence me. You cannot allow them to continue living. Because if you do, your kingdom is going to fall apart. And people are going to lose respect. So something has to be done about them. And so now I want you to notice what we find in verse 9. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written. The decree is what? Written. That is important. It's a written decree. We'll come back to that. That they may be what? Destroyed. Is this a death decree? Yes. Is it a written death decree? Yes. yes, it is. Let the decree be written that they be destroyed. And now notice he bribes the king. He says, Here, this is going to be a good deal for you. He says, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring them into the king's treasuries. So the king says, hey, this is a winner. 
you know, if these people really don't obey my laws and my commands, well, I probably should eradicate them. Let me ask you, is the king really the enemy of God's people? He's only the enemy insofar as he allows himself to be used by Haman and deceived by Haman. So it says in verse 10, So the king took his signet ring, his great seal. The, se the ring was what was used to sign documents, to authenticate documents. So it says, So the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman. Did he implicitly trust Haman? Yeah. It says here, here's my seal. Do something about it. So he gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money and the people are given to you. Do with them as seems good to you. Well, let me ask you, who is the enemy here? Is it the king who's the enemy? No. Does the king know what's going on? The king doesn't have the foggiest idea what's going on. He's simply listening to his religious advisor. You know, tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, four Elijahs in Scripture. One of those Elijahs was John the Baptist. Right? Yeah. In three places in the New Testament we find that John the Baptist is Elijah. And I'll give you a little inkling of what we're going to take a look at. Lo and behold, John the Baptist also had three enemies. The Elijah of the Old Testament had three enemies. The end time Elijah has three enemies. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. John the Baptist had three enemies. You say, what were the three enemies of John the Baptist, the New Testament Elijah? Have you ever read the story of the death of John the Baptist? Do you have a king involved in this story? Yes. Is the king the dangerous figure? The king isn't the dangerous figure. The king is oblivious to what's really going on. He's drinking wine, you know, he's having a party. But there's someone who wants the death of John the Baptist. Who is that? It's Herodias, the harlot, adulterous woman, because he was living with his brother's wife. See, so you have an adulterous woman involved. But the adulterous woman cannot do things on her own. She uses her daughter to influence the king to kill John the Baptist. Is that an interesting story? The same is true at the end of time. There is a harlot, Revelation 17. She fornicates with the kings of the earth, but she can't accomplish its purposes, uh, her purposes without her daughters. Apostate Protestants, Protestantism. And during the Dark Ages you have the same thing. That woman Jezebel, it says in the church of Thyatira. And she had children that were born from her. The Protestant denomination. And she fornicated with the kings of Europe. And so you have this trilogy of enemies against God's people, and the king is never the enemy, unless he is influenced by someone else. Let me ask you, was Herod a menace to John the Baptist? No. The Bible says he actually enjoyed listening to him. When did the king become a menace to John the Baptist? He became a menace to John the Baptist when he allowed the adulterous woman to use her daughter to influence him to kill John the Baptist. Do you think the kings of the world are the real enemies of God's people in the end time? No. The kings of the earth are not the enemies of God's people. When do they become the enemies of God's people? They become the enemies of God's people when they allow the church to jump on them and to ask them to impose the decrees of the church. At that moment, then, they become, the kings become dangerous to God's people because they're influenced by the church. So this is the picture that you have here 
in the book of Esther. Now let's continue there in chapter 3, and let's read verse 12. Chapter 3 and verse 12. Was the king deceived by, by uh, Haman? <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. Fisherman, fisher, fishing pole, boat. He was totally hoodwinked. Now notice verse 12. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month. And a decree was written according to all, now listen, a decree is written in the king's name, but it says to all that Haman commanded. So Haman is commanding with the authority of whom? Of the king. To the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all the people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. Was this a decree that covered the entire empire? It most certainly did. In the name of King Ahasuerus it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. This is a religious decree imposed by the secular power. Let's start to ring a bell. And it's a death decree. And the death decree has a date, we're going to notice in a minute. And when that date arrives, people are free to kill the Jews. Notice verse 13. It says, And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces, and notice how much hatred we're talking about here. To destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews. I think that he kind of hated them. Three words. To kill, destroy, and to annihilate all the Jews. Both young and old, little children and women. In one day, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. So how much time between when the decree is given and when the decree is to be executed? Exactly 11 months. And after 11 months, all of the Jews of the kingdom could be killed. Notice verse 14. A copy of the document was to be issued as a law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day. So you can just picture everybody getting ready to execute the death decree at a given moment. Does that sound familiar? If you read Great Controversy, page 635, it says that there's a death decree, and at a certain date, everyone is to gather to slay God's people. And Ellen White says that the decree that will be given against God's people in the end time will be very similar to the one that was given in the days of Esther. Verse 15, the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king, and now here comes a very interesting thing, so the king and Haman sat down to drink. What, H2O? <laughs> Absolutely not. What did they sit down to drink? Why? Is wine involved in this story? Oh, absolutely. Is wine involved in the book of Revelation? It most certainly is. So this decree was universal. This decree was dated. This decree was religious hatred vented through the political power, and everyone is told to be ready for that day to execute the death decree. And incidentally, the death decree was irrevocable. In the book Prophets and Kings, page 601, Ellen White makes this comment about this death decree. She says, the, death, the decree of the Medes and Persians could not be revoked. Apparently there was no hope. All the Israelites were doomed to destruction. In themselves, how much hope did the remnant have? The remnant had absolutely no hope in themselves. They were subject to a death decree of an alliance between the king and a religious figure 
and the religious figure was manipulated by his wife. And so there appeared to be no hope. And so an agonizing time of trouble ensues for Mordecai and his people. Esther chapter 4 and verses 1 to 3 describes that time of trouble. When Mordecai learned of all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth put on sackcloth and ashes. What, what does that mean? He tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. Is this extreme agony and anguish? It's mourning. It's lamentation. Why? He's lamenting because people are going to be killed. He's lamenting before the fact. And so it says he goes out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Would you describe this as a time of trouble? Absolutely. He went as far as the front gate, front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. A time of trouble such as never had been seen before that time. There was only one hope, and that hope rested in a next of kin of Mordecai. Her name was Esther. If somehow Mordecai could convince Esther to go before the king to unmask the plot, and intercede for God's people, God's people might just be delivered from certain death. So let me ask you, who is the heroine of this story? It is Esther. It's not Mordecai. It's not Israel. The only hope of Israel was found in Esther. She is the intercessor. She is going to unmask this diabolical plot of a union of church and state. And she is going to intervene so that God's people are not destroyed by this death decree. If you go to Esther chapter 4 verses 8 and 9, we find something very interesting. It says there, he also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go to the king to make supplication to him. Uh, is she going to go and supplicate? Is she going to go and intercede? Yes. And plead. Notice, make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So what is Esther? What is the role of Esther? Esther is one who pleads. She is one who supplicates. She is one who represents God's people. And so Mordecai gives this to Esther, and he says to Esther something very interesting. Notice verses 13 through 17. And Mordecai told them, to answer Esther. He sends messengers. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all of the other Jews. Don't think that you're because the queen, because you're the queen, that you're going to escape and the king's going to make an exception in your case because the decree says all Jews will be killed and you're one of them. For if you remain, notice, if you remain completely silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And then he says, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Do you realize what he's saying to Esther? He's saying to Esther, do you know what? It's a miracle that a Jewess would be the wife of the king of the Medes and Persians. 
actually of the Persians at this point. God has placed you as the queen in the kingdom for this moment. This is your destiny. To go in and supplicate and intercede for your people. God has placed you for this specific reason. For this time and this place. He says if you don't go in, you and your father house are going to perish. And God is going to find some other way to deliver his people. Notice verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Were the interests of Esther welded with those of her people? She said, I am willing to die in order to save my people. Does that sound familiar? Can you think of anyone else who said, I'm willing to die to save my people? Jesus, and then somebody else. Moses, at the top of Mount Sinai. When Israel worshipped the golden calf, Moses went before the Lord, he said, Lord, if you can't save your people, strike my name from your book. I love my people so much that I cannot even think of the possibility of me living and then dying. If I perish, I perish. So Esther is a symbol of Christ, whose interests are welded to ours because Jesus is in a covenant relationship with his people. Jesus is committed to protect his people. Because once we enter a covenant with him, Jesus says, I am committed to you because you are committed to me. So we need to understand end time events in the context of the covenant. The covenant of God's people with the Lord. Ellen White in Prophets and Kings, page 601, speaks of the role of Esther when she says, Mordecai was a near relative of hers that is of Esther, in their extremity they decided to appeal to Xerxes, Ellen White uses the Greek name, to appeal to Xerxes in behalf of their people. Esther was to venture into his presence as an intercessor. What was the word? She was to venture in as a what? As an intercessor. She's going to intercede for her people. But before she goes in before the king, she does something. She changes her garments from her common garments to her royal robes. Does that sound familiar? Is Jesus going to change his garments when probation closes and he rises to defend his people? At that time, Michael shall stand up. That's the close of probation. And then he will protect his people. Notice Esther chapter 5 and verse 1. At chapter 5 and verse 1. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her what? Her royal robes. And stood in the inner court of the king's palace. Across from the king's house. While the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house. Facing the entrance of the house. So what does Esther do? She puts on her garments. Her royal garments. Like Jesus, when probation closes, when the death decree has been given, is going to put on his royal robes. And then we find that Haman is invited to a banquet with Queen Esther. And then after this, I'm synthesizing, Haman is invited to another banquet the next day. And Haman is pre feeling pretty good about himself. He says, ha, the queen and the king invited me to a banquet. Isn't this wonderful? What he doesn't know is that his experience is going to be very bitter. In fact, when he goes uh, to the king's party or to the king's banquet, he's filled with joy, but at the same time he goes home and he talks to his wife. This is in chapter 5, verses 10 through 14. And he says, you know, 
this would be the most joyous day of my life if it wasn't for Mordecai who doesn't bow and give me reverence. So his experience is joyful, but at the same time he's bitterly angry because the remnant does not bow and render him the reverence that he feels that he deserves. And so Zeresh says, hey, quit complaining. Just go put up a gallows where, where Mordecai can hang, and that'll take care of it. That's in chapter 5, verses 10 through 14. Now it's very interesting that the story now takes a twist. And that is that there is an investigative judgment. <laughs> what? An investigative judgment? Absolutely. You see, Mordecai had once saved the life of the king. And it was written in the annals of the king that he had delivered the king. But he had never been rewarded for what he did. And so it says in Esther chapter 6 and verse 1, that night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And what, which volume do you think they read? <laughs> the story of how Mordecai had delivered the life of the king. And so the king says, hey, you know, we never rewarded this guy. Are the books going to be examined? And is the reward for God's people going to be determined? Yes. And the enemies are going to see the reward of God's people. You can read it in the spirit of prophecy. And you can read it in the psalm. And so now what happens is the king can't sleep, so he has the chronicles brought. He discovers that Mordecai was never rewarded for his, for his good works. And so he calls in Haman. He says, Haman, there's this, he doesn't mention the name. He says, there's this individual that was good to the king. He delivered the life of the king. What do you suppose we should do with that man? <laughs> there's a little bit of humor in this story. Yeah. Esther 6, verses 7 through 9. And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, he says, That's me. <laughs> Let a royal robe be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king is, has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor, because he's thinking, that, he's thinking that's me. He doesn't know that the records have been examined. <laughs> then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And so the king says, do that with Mordecai. <laughs> what an insult. <laughs> Things are starting to change. The decisions of men are being revoked and are being overturned. Esther 6 verses 10 and 11. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse, as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. <laughs> oh, what an insult. The wicked shall see the reward of the righteous, is what it says in the book of Psalms. So the second banquet, Haman comes, and Esther takes the opportunity to explain to the king what Haman had really done. He tells the king, you know, Haman, this, this nasty individual Haman, he wants to destroy all the Jews, which means that I would be destroyed too. Ooh, now the king wakes up from his slumber. Now his deception leaves him. Now he knows that his religious advisor has deceived him into proclaiming this decree. And now he is enraged, but he is not enraged against the Jews. He is enraged against the creator of the plot. The weapons that were to be used for the destruction of Mordecai now destroy Haman and his family. You have this 
this prefiguring of what is going to happen under the sixth plague. We're going to talk about this later on this week. Ellen White says that, that the world will be ready to execute the death decree. They will have their weapons ready to execute God's people. And when they're about to deliver the blow of death, there will be darkness like the darkest night that will fall upon the earth. And she says that the angry multitudes who wanted to execute the death decree will suddenly be arrested. The waters upon which the harlot sat which are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, that she used to try and drown God's people, now will arise to drown her. The very instruments that she wanted to use to destroy God's people will be used to destroy her. We have a prefiguring of that in the book of Esther. Because the weapons that were to be used to destroy Mordecai were actually used to destroy the one who created the plot, along with his family. And so Esther talks to the king and says, this is what's really behind this. And the king is filled with rage. And he turns on Haman. And Haman comes to Esther and he says, please Esther, intercede for me. Esther said, intercession has closed. Probation has closed for you who proclaimed the death decree. Isn't this an amazing story? This is a prophetic story. In chapter 7 and verse 7, we find these words. Then the king arose in his wrath. <laughs> now he's wrathful, but he's not wrathful against God's people. Now God's people are safe. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine. So he was drinking wine. But he became sober in a hurry, by the way. And went into the palace garden, but Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life. For he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. So she, he says, Esther, please intercede for me. Esther says, there is no intercession for you, the creator of this plot. Interesting story, isn't it? You have the change of garments, you have the investigative judgment, you have the reward according to works. As it says in Revelation chapter 22, you have a death decree, you have a remnant that refuses to worship, you have all of the elements of the end time crisis that we find in the book of Revelation. And then of course, Haman dies with the very weapons that he prepared against God's people. And you know, you find this phenomenon constantly in Bible prophecy. And we'll deal with this later on in this seminar. The Jews said, this man must die or the Romans will take away our nation. But by killing him, the, Roman took, the Romans took away their nation. What they wished to prevent, they caused. Those who threw Daniel into the lion's den ended up being eaten by the lions. They were cat food. <laughs> At the end time, the multitudes who were going to destroy God's people will destroy the religious advisors. In the French Revolution, the state that had been used by the kings, the, the state that had been used by the church, turned against the church and no longer against the remnant. This is a recurring theme in Scripture. And when the kings of the earth, of this world, wake up and they see that apostate Protestantism and Roman Catholicism has deceived them into giving religious decrees, their anger will be uncontrollable. And this is a message for the kings of this world. Don't allow the church to get involved in civil matters because it will lead to bad results. It has been shown all throughout history. It's a sobering fact, folks, that Jesus was killed by a union of church and state. In fact, the whole experience of Jesus will be repeated with God's people. You know, the Jews brought... Uh, the, the Jews, first of all, had a religious trial for Jesus. The Sanhedrin. They said, this man is worthy of death. But as a church, they could not execute the death decree. Whose help did they need? The help of the state. And so they go to Pilate. And they say, Pilate, we want you to give the decree to execute this man. And Pilate says, what has he done wrong? Well, he's, he's blasphemed. Because he claims to be the Son of God. 
And, and Pilate says, well, what does that have to do with my kingdom? And after examining him, he says, this man, I find no fault in him. I don't find any fault in him. But it's interesting that Pilate did what the church wanted because of political pressure. He was afraid of losing his position because the Jews said, if you don't condemn this man, we will tell Caesar that you are not Caesar's friend and he will remove you from your political position. Folks, the greatest enemies of God's people who, throughout history have been those churches that have joined the state to persecute God's people. Whenever you join church and state, the result is evil. Because God has said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They are two kingdoms that, has been, that have been established by Jesus. They both have their legitimate place. The problem is when you mix the iron and the clay, when the harlot fornicates with the kings of the earth, then what is good, separate, becomes evil together. And God is warning the world with this. You know, the United Nations and the kings of the world, they should stay aloof as far away as possible from religious issues and from the church because it will come back to bite them. And so the plot is unveiled. Notice Esther chapter 7 verse 10. It says, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head, and that he and his sons should be hung on the what? On the gallows. Notice Esther 8, verses 3 through 6. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward, El toward Esther, so Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces, for how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? She doesn't say to me. She doesn't say to me. She says to my people. Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? What is the passion of Esther? The people. So let me ask you, who is the hero of this story? Esther. Without Esther, they're lost. Who was the hero of the story of the three young men in the fiery furnace? Oh, dare to be a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I say, praise the Lord. We need to have that kind of a character. But if it hadn't been for Jesus, all the faith in the world would not have saved them. And so the hero of these stories is Jesus. Not only as a savior from slavery to sin, as a spiritual savior, but as a literal savior from death at the end of time. Jesus is a savior in every sense of the word. And so the day of the battle came. You know, the laws of the Medes and Persians could not be revoked. And so the decree had to remain. But now the king gave a new decree. He said, the Jews can defend themselves. And you know what's interesting? They didn't have to, because the angels did. Let me read you from Prophets and Kings, page 602. Are the angels going to fight for God's people in the end time? Oh, you better believe it. Ellen White says this, Angels that excel in strength have been commissioned by God to protect His people while they stood for their lives. So the angels took the battlefield in favor of God's people. And then, after the day of the battle, came the celebration. They established a new feast which is known as the Feast of Purim. It was a celebration. It's, it's similar to a Mardi Gras. It's a Jewish Mardi Gras. 
You know, these days they wear masks and they have a lot of music and a lot of food and a lot of dancing. I mean, it's, it's just a, a festive time because they're remembering their deliverance from certain death in the days of Esther. And so it says in Esther 9, in verses 17 and verse 18, it says, And on the fourteenth day of the month they rested. Do you know what the word rested there? It's the word nuach. It's the same word that appears in the fourth commandment. It doesn't mean to cease. It means to enjoy delightful rest after much turmoil. And so it says they rested and made it a day of what? Feasting and gladness. And on the fourteenth day of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. The name of Esther isn't mentioned in this book. The name of God is not mentioned in this book, in the book of Esther. And some people wonder why. I'm going to tell you what I believe is the reason why the name of God is not mentioned in this book. It's because God wants to reveal how he works providentially behind the scenes of history. Let me ask you, if you read the book of Esther, is it quite obvious that there's another power that's working behind the scenes? Of course there is. And so what God wants to show is that human history is guided by a divine hand. And he doesn't include the name of God there because he wants to show that even though you don't have God written all of, over these events, that it is the hand of the invisible God that is guiding the events of the human race. I'd like to end by reading two statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. Incidentally, this story is very similar to the story of Joseph. Isn't it? You read the story of Joseph, of course the name of God is mentioned there, but you can't help but see how God's hand is guiding at every step. I mean, it's as subtle as a freight train. It's as subtle as a tornado or those jets that fly across here every so often. Prophets and Kings 605 and 606. Ellen White makes the parable, parallel between the days of Esther and our days. Satan will arouse indignation against the minority who refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. Wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt. Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them with voice and pen, by boasts, threats, and ridicule. They will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, men will stir up the passions of the people. Not having a thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath, they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for Sunday laws. So who is the moving force behind Sunday laws? It's the religious power. It says to secure popularity and patronage. By the way, that means to get votes. Legislators will yield to the demand for Sunday laws. But those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates a precept of the Decalogue. On this battlefield will be fought the last great conflict in the controversy between truth and error. And we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Today, as in the days of Esther and Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate His truth and His people. And do you know who is going to be the person that will go and intercede before the Father? It will be Jesus Christ. Actually, Ellen White says that he will go before the Father and he will utter the words of John chapter 17 and verse 24 where he says, Father, those that you have given to me, I want them to be where I am. 
and then God will arise to deliver His people. The last statement I want to read is from Prophets and Kings, page 605, where the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that the decree that will finally go forth against the remnant people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews. And in other places, Ellen White explains that the death decree will have a date and that after a period of time, the date arrives and people will be free to slay God's remnant people. So what happened locally, over there in Persia, becomes a local symbol with literal individuals of a global experience of God's people at the end of time. And the personages in the story become symbolic of global entities. In other words, you're not talking about a literal Haman or a little king. You're talking about all of the kings of the world. You see, it becomes much larger in the time of fulfillment. You're not talking about an individual Haman. You're talking about the daughters of the harlot. You're not talking about the wife of Haman. You're talking about another church that manipulates her daughters. You're not talking about Mordecai, you're talking about God's people all over the world. So what was local and literal, and we're going to study this tomorrow in our next principle, what is local and literal in the Old Testament becomes global and spiritual at the end of time. It is an important principle of prophetic interpretation. And if you read the book, The Certainty of the Third Angel's Message, you were able to see that principle almost on every single page of that magnificent book. Other than great controversy, hands down, it's the greatest book I believe that has ever been written on Bible prophecy, The Certainty of the Third Angel's Message. That's why I ask you to read it. It's not an easy read. <laughs> but if you bear with it, you will be amazed at the truth that you find in this book. Of course, great controversy is number one on the list. That's in layman's language, easy to understand. And it has all of these principles when you study carefully. So folks, let's look up. Jesus is coming soon, and he will protect his people.